So our next incredible speaker is Tom McKenzie. He's Global Innovation Director at the agency PhD. And his talk is Capitalize on Creativity. Tom, if you're there, you've got 99 seconds. Remember, you get horned off after 99 seconds. Then we'll go to questions. So if you're ready, Tom, yeah, all good. starts now. Cool. Um, so innovation is really born out of uncertainty. And, you know, the situation we find ourselves in is pretty uncertain times. But these kind of constraints often lead us to kind of channel our creativity and be a little bit more resourceful and inventive with what we do. We think there are kind of two areas really to kind of to focus on. The first, the first one is really about rethinking what is communicated. So what, what can brands share beyond advertising to kind of offer value and start to build slightly more uh, meaningful and, and longer term relationships with their audience? For example, every brand is powered by you know, designers, scientists, engineers. Why not use that as a creative platform to kind of inform and entertain in equal measure? And just rethinking how we how we take advertising out and, and not kind of traditional ads, but, but kind of services and, and almost let people in to see the skills which kind of power that brand um, in a slightly more compelling way. Then on the other side of things is creating new ways to communicate. And I mean, I think we all know that kind of consumer behavior, media behavior is massively changed Mr. Back, uh, kind of a backdrop of limited in-person contact. And this is a really op interesting opportunity to kind of elevate customer experience and personalization by kind of delivering personality through technology. Kind of fundamentally as humans, we're kind of hardwired to, to best respond to faces. They create trust and memorability. So rather than kind of personalization, here in this kind of a text-based format, it's kind of surfaced via an algorithm. What if we can use the likes of synthetic media to help visualize this, kind of add a human face to that recommendation? So I think the kind of um, platform which is used to communicate it is almost as impactful as the message itself. And if we skip to the next slide, we don't even need a real person. And um, this is kind of spooky and great in equal measure, but this is just um, all of these faces are generated by AI. None of these people are real. You can see how the progress has kind of escalated in, in the past few years. So if we add kind of a face to our personalization and almost like custom brand avatars, we can create this infinite suite of kind of new brand, uh, I guess, almost ambassadors to deliver our messages. Um, there we go. That's good enough. Just hold off. <laughs> You almost got a lot across. So there's loads to talk about there. Let's go into some Q&A. Uh, I guess the first question, I think, which is, again, we see this all the time. A couple of people have asked this in different ways. Lucia asks, do you think a brand needs a dedicated innovation budget? Um, I think it, <laughs> it's a great question. Um, I, don't, I don't think so. Um, speaking from kind of the work we do, innovation is really, the definition is just a new method or technique. So innovation should really kind of be baked in through everything we do. I think how we kind of approach it is it's almost a spectrum. You have very much the kind of elevation of brilliant basics, which, which should almost be uh, mandatory on every kind of um, piece of comms which is delivered, right through to the slightly more kind of jazz hands, um, stereotypes version of innovation. But I don't think there should be a separate budget. I think it should kind of find its way to manifest itself in, in kind of everything we do. There's a question here from, let me surprise everyone listening, it's Julia. Julia asks, you talk about new ways of communicating, but I'm curious as to what old ways of communicating should really not be used today. Good question, Julia. Good question. Um, it's a really good question. I mean, in these times, I think people have obviously found um, kind of new ways to socialise, new ways to behave. I don't necessarily think there are kind of old channels or ways to, to not communicate in. I think um, the kind of the stock phrase is the oldest media reinvents itself to keep up with the, the pace of change. So I think there's never almost um, a, a kind of an old channel to disregard. It's finding, it's kind of probing it to find actually new ways to communicate through it as much as kind of disregarding it. I think um, pe people are often quick to write off certain channels or, or kind of even uh, communication platforms, but it's about finding a slightly kind of um, opening door and, and nuance in it to, to to deliver a message in a slightly more compelling way using it. That kind of makes sense. Good answer, yeah, perfect answer. Uh, there's a question here from Umberto, Umberto, I think you said, uh, who says, how can I bring my board along for the ride? I do believe that innovation is so important to how we change as a brand, but my board seem stuck in the mud. <laughs> it's a question we get all the time. Um, innovation is kind of that, that dirty word. I think, I think the first thing to set out is, is innovation, you have to be prepared to fail. Um, by the nature of it, it's kind of doing new things. Um, and again, new things mean kind of di different things to different people. But I think so firstly, setting out that notion of that we have to be prepared to kind of fail um, to innovate and to progress is really important. Um, so I think, I think that's kind of the main one, really. Perfect, okay, lovely question here from Freddie who asks, should we now be, <laughs> okay, this goes back to your, your slide, should we now be using fake people as our brand? <laughs> 
it's a good question. This, this was always going to come up with uh, with that image. It's a, it's a really, obviously, it's um, an ethically difficult question. But the, the reason I thought I just kind of would mention it is we're in a world where um, kind of filming, production, and, and that side of things is really on pause. Um, and every brand seems to be delivering a very, very similar message, um, albeit with a new one. I mean, I've never had so many emails from CEOs of brands who, who kind of care about me. And I think if we can use um, a shortcut to create new people to deliver the message, to kind of engage in platforms which have would, would kind of been embraced as part of this, um, it, it's very much that human layer, really. I mean, it, it, it's, it's a difficult one. It's an ethical one. Um, I think as well, I would probably say, kind of make clear that it's, that it's not a real person. I think the backlash you'd face off that is, is huge and, and probably not worth it. So outlining very clearly that it, that it is an AI generated person, but the opportunity it kind of, it presents it is, is huge from localizing, um, from, from different kind of countries, localizing who delivers the message. Um, it is super interesting and, and something we can do in a world of, of no filming. Tom, amazing. We've got one last question here I'm going to go to, which is from, uh, Kami, Kame, Kwame, sorry, Kwame, Kwame, who asks, uh, what's your advice on how you walk the line between personalized brand experiences and creepy ones? <laughs> yeah, it's a very, very fine line. I think it's really, um, it sounds so obvious, it's, it's really just being real and human. I think what people sometimes do is, you know, that some of this tech is, is called deep fake, which is a horrible phrase, um, and, it, and it does worry people. But I think, um, I think it's just being real and human. It's really, as I say, setting out from the start, very clear about kind of what, um, what you're kind of experiencing and, and that it's not a real person. And I think that's the kind of key thing. Again, I, I know I kind of repeating myself, but I think if people understand that that person isn't real, they're not, they're not gonna be able to respond to everything. Um, it, it kind of puts people at ease rather than thinking it's some kind of mythical, mythical face which can, can address any and every need. Um, I, think, I think that's the key one. Tom, fantastic. Lots of good answers to difficult questions. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, thank you. Now we're going to move on uh, in a bit to our next speaker, but first we've got lots of sort of announcements to do. First of all, uh, to everyone, there's been some discussion behind the scenes that the Marmite competition has not been agreed internally. It has. You can win a jar of Andy's Marmite for the best question. So let's go and talk about what's going on behind the scenes. Obviously, it's not just what you're looking at on the screen with all the amazing speakers and uh, discussions going on. There's lots of interactive stuff going on on the app. Now, one of the most important things is obviously polls run by our poll master. Andy, let's have some poll chat. Poll chat. Poll chat. What, what else do you want to talk about on a Wednesday afternoon? Right, let's have a look. Where are our polls? The poll we had, well, the first poll we had this morning was, is it actually Wednesday? Which only 50% people agreed to, I which, yeah. which does so, worry me. Yeah. Um, our current live poll is, do marketers really understand gaming channels? Um, mm -hmm. And this is interesting, because if you remember yesterday when we had which is the, the fastest growing programmatic mm -hmm. market yeah. in game one that. But on this and programmatic out of home was behind it, wasn't it? Absolutely, yeah. So looking at the app now where you can go and see all the live polls, um, 57 no, it's just gone up. 63% think of mark, the gaming channel is still thought of as a channel to youth. Only six percent think entirely that Mark does understand that. That's interesting I do think you know we've heard from so many great experiments of gaming as a as a a media and marketing channel, but that view still exists. You know, talk to anyone seeing in a media agency, and they still have a hard time getting these campaigns off the ground. CMOs, in the most part, still don't understand the channel. Marketers still believe that gaming is is a, you know, it's a medium of youth, and I think that's true. That's what it was ten years ago, but it's definitely not true now. Stats are out that actually more more women and girls are gamers than than mm. sort of the males. Yeah. And it's going to be interesting as we come out of the lockdown, obviously gaming channels have been huge over the last three months. Uh, how many people will stick with that? How many people will think that's a channel we need to stay on? Because, you know, we hear a lot, and we've, we've written a lot about you know, what will be the new behaviours after, mm -hmm. after the COVID outbreak. It, it'll be interesting to me if people do stick with that or if people will rush straight away to business as usual. I suppose they say it results driven you know, have been getting get results and getting the right audiences doing the right thing to their brand and maybe the payments will, will stick i hope so i hope so i think i think we need to see some changes in that whole system as we've again we've written about a lot over the last couple of years right we've got some more things we need to talk about um pizzas games pizzas networking. yeah networking sarah mann in the pub section of the app is saying she's making 
a good-natured attempt, don't be good-natured, Sarah, <laughs> there's no need for that, a good-natured attempt to, to, to topple Ian Houghton from the, uh, the top marketer. Um, everybody is putting, there's a lot of weight going behind Sarah here, so let's get on with that. Let's beat Ian, let's beat Ian down. Yeah. It's a general thing. <laughs> also, Sarah has, in the uh, most useless lockdown purchase, um, I would urge you all to go and have a look at this ridiculous thing that Sarah's bought. It's, it's a tiny, tiny, tiny pedal bank bike. Just, it's not gonna work. I'm gonna, I'm, you see that? It looks like a bike attached to a phone. Can people see that on the screen? I'll tell you what, it'd be easier if you went to the app, <laughs> to the app. rather than me flinging sense. my screen at your screen. But that, that's a good, that, I think that's a winner so far. Um, there's a pasta maker here, which um, if any of anyone was watching at Oaks Towers, I think we could also agree that a pasta maker did make an up, probably unscheduled appearance in our house and will be sent to the garage. So get your pasta maker there. pictures on, you know, you can win. Well, what else is going competition wise? There's the networking challenge. From my there's the networking challenge. There's the, ooh, bookshelves. Bookshelves. Yeah, it's been a very disappointing day. It's been a dry show. day, you know. Yesterday was good. The end of yesterday was quite a sort of a, a seismic day for bookshelf watching. But yeah, today's been dry. So any speakers still getting ready? If you want to move rooms to a room potentially with a good bookshelf in, I say that's a good idea. Bookshelf challenge is running live. Pizza as well. Please don't forget. Pizza into your address into the app. Whether you're being asked to, you have you had an application, you get a chance to win a pizza delivered to your door on Friday maybe the golden ticket inside. If um, you're being shy, I can guarantee it won't be one of us delivering a pizza to your door. Well, it could be one of us. Well, unless they live in Kent or Essex. Unless you want both of us, that'd be an extra special problem. Now, I think, should we now go to some artwork? Artwork, we can go to artwork, if can we, we can have artwork? the artwork on the screen, please. This is Free Blind Mice, who always sort of bring to life visually the, the conference. Madfest are always there, but here they're doing it virtually, so you can see here. These will be, on NDA and Madfest sites over the next few days. There should be a competition to win some original artwork. There isn't, <laughs> <laughs> but there may be. So Three Blind Mice, they are amazing. Three Blind Mice, they bring to life any event and they're definitely worth, this is sort of free plug for them because they are brilliant. I'm talking to if you want to add some sort of creative genius to any event, virtual or not. So I think you all know most events at the moment are virtual. And yeah, wait till physical events happen again. Get three blind mice along to do this live because it's a wonderful, wonderful process to watch happening live. Right. I think we're gonna cut in a minute. We're gonna but amazingly, we're sort of ahead of schedule. Yesterday, as I keep saying, we we're 15 minutes over over schedule, about which I felt personally ashamed. You did feel quite ashamed. I, I still feel quite ashamed. But today we're finishing bang on time, if not a few seconds before. Uh, so let's move on any second now to our next speakers. Uh, Janelle, if you're ready, we're coming to you any second now. Just to quickly remind everyone, at the bottom of your screen, I know I keep going on about it, but our Q&A icon, right at the bottom there, little small little cute Q&A icon, click it and give me your questions. We'll pick the best. So There's a question insightful. for us there, actually. There's a question for us? Yeah. Okay, let's go for a question for us. You're not really asked to ask us questions. <laughs> Why aren't we seeing the NDA all... Oh, Blue Stripe bookshelf. I know it's there. It is there, but we're slightly shamed of it. So you, you can't see it. You can't see our bookshelf. You can't see a bookshelf. Sorry. They can't, can they? They can't. No. no you Should can, we do some real content? Because I okay, think we've now got on. to the point where, frankly, I'm bored of talking about No one gets bored of bookshelves. Okay, let's move on. So we have an amazing speaker. It's Janelle Estes. She's Chief Insights Officer from User Testing. Our talk is Empathy, the Marketer's Secret to exceptional CX. Again, don't forget, Q&A icon, bottom of your screen, click to enter your questions. So Janelle, if you're there, over to you. Again, you've got exactly 99 seconds. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so 75% of organizations think they're customer centric. However, only 30% of customers actually believe that to be true. And what this shows is a strong mismatch between what organizations think they're delivering and what they're actually delivering. And this is what we call the empathy gap. And the reason why it exists is because companies don't truly understand their customers or the humans that engage with them. And without that understanding, they're bound to miss the mark. Your brand is one of the very first impressions someone has with your organization. So how do you ensure that you're making an authentic connection with your customers? You put yourself in, your, in their shoes. 
And how do marketers usually do that? They design personas, they create segments, they lean on buyer profiles, a name, age, location, and even an income is chosen for them. But that's not practicing genuine customer empathy. And unfortunately, these frameworks are built on assumptions and not true customer understanding. To build an exceptional experience, organizations must put the real voice of their customers at the center of it. The brands that practice genuine and thoughtful customer empathy are the ones that stand out a mile from the ones that simply believe that they're customer centric. At user testing, we work with brands to build customer empathy driven cultures powered by human insight. And up next, you're going to hear from one of our customers who is doing just that. You're now perfect timing under 99 seconds. So we'll go straight in now, as we said to all your customers, ask just Justin Bacovi, who's Chief Product Officer at Your MD. Justin, you have again 99 seconds. Janelle did it, so let's hope you can too. Over to you. Great. Hi, I'm Justin Bacovi. I'm the Chief Product Officer at Your MD. We're the self care app that is on a mission to help a billion people live happier, healthier lives. Um, super here, uh, happy to be here along with such great talent and minds. And I wanted to share with you today some insights on how we dial into empathy with our users, not necessarily to let them dictate our product roadmap, but to help shape our product positioning, as well as the features or themes that we need to build or change. Um, health right now is obviously the biggest global concern, be it physical or mental. And so for us, it's important that even though our vision might be three years away in terms of our product, we have to capture the hearts and minds of the here and now for our users and land them in a familiar territory that's aligned to their expectations. In these challenging times, we find humanity looking for new solutions. People are taking things into their own hands, and that includes their health and self-care. We're not only pivoting our product, but embarking on a deep dive into our brand. So we need to speak to these people and understand their pains. We can't do focus groups or traditional meetups or spend months embarking on like meeting up with people and bringing them into a locale. So we use live conversation in the user testing platform to connect to our users over video, one-on-one, -on -one, where we can read their physical emotions, facial expressions, and more. And we put products, prototypes, and brand messaging in front of these users before going to market. And we get validation and we get results instantly. And this settles for us internal bottlenecks in product development, but it gives us more validation that we might have previously had to wait months for via traditional methods in a pre-COVID world. And I hope I'm just on time there. Oh, you had three seconds there. <laughs> Amazing work. Superb, fantastic. So great talks, nicely integrated. Obviously, this is such hot area, CX and, and empathy. Empathy was our a phrase used quite a lot yesterday, actually, interesting enough. So let's dig in some questions. These questions will be out to either of you. Uh, first of all, from another shy attendee, Anonymous, is the empathy gap as much to do with an organization, an organization's lack of honest, in brackets, understanding about itself as it is knowing their customers? Um, can I jump in on that one? It's a great question. Um, and I think that, uh, I think they go hand in hand. I think, you deep dive into your users and customers and you frame the honesty of your organization appropriately. You know, uh, you're only as honest as your best intentions. Um, and I think that's uh, an ongoing challenge for building products um, and marketing is, you know, how deep do you go? We are in times now where I feel that this is more important than ever. You know, and that's what I was saying is that you have to reach out and be empathetic um, because people want to be heard. And that's born, been borne out by all the social stuff you've seen recently in the news, I guess. Fantastic, super. Okay, the next, next question I've got here is from Martin, who asks, uh, surprise, surprise, what are the most interesting changes in this area you've seen during COVID and do you expect these to continue? Um, if I could jump in for this one. So what I've seen to be really interesting during this time is Quite honestly, uh, companies are no longer able to really meet their customers in person. You know, traditional focus groups, one-on-one -on -one interviews, intercepting people in a coffee shop, all of these tactics that we've used are really no longer available to us. And so I've seen a massive shift to connecting with customers remotely. So, you know, the live conversation is something that Justin talked about, but also I just see this across the board and across the industry. I don't think that's gonna change anytime soon. And quite honestly, I think people have found that they're able to make that same authentic connection um, remotely, especially with technologies like Zoom um, or GoToMeeting where you can actually see someone's face. 
um, and make that you know human to human connection. So I guess the, the big change that I've seen is a shift from traditionally in-person methods to um, remote and online. I guess this, this question is quite related. Kieran asks, when, you, when it comes to empathy and how brands uh, interact with their customers, what are the most interesting differences across different platforms? I'm assuming it means across mobile or across online or you know, different ways of interacting. How does empathy change? I think, um, I don't necessarily think uh, it necessarily changes um, uh, with the platform and inherently in terms of uh, what we do in user experience, there are obviously fundamentals that are attributable and different uh, across different platforms, but the core like jobs to be done function will always be the same regardless of, of what you're using. And so I think that um, for me, uh, the, the dialing into empathy uh, is across all of those. I don't think, I don't see it as a, a, a differentiator really. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I think we have to stop thinking about the customer experience and building empathy by channel or by, you know, a platform. It's just one cohesive journey in the customer's mind and in the customer's eyes. So I wholeheartedly agree with Justin there. Great. Now, next one's from Leslie and she or he asks, is empathy a viable strategy for a scale-up brand that previously, previously prioritized growth? Good question. Got to play a role in there somewhere. Um, you know, it's a battle. You know, you want to grow. You've got to, got to reach out to your users. You've got to um, see it as a. In, in, I see it as an integral driver for sure. Um, and it is that constant, um, you, you know, struggle between the two, between ramping up numbers and ramping up uh, meaning and value. Um, it's a challenge for sure. But they also very much go hand in hand. Yeah. You can't, you're not going to ramp up growth and, and numbers without actually providing value. And the only way to know value is to really understand what your customers need and want. Okay, question here from Katrina, something being asked constantly is, what brands do you think have done a good job in this regard over the last three months? I mean, we heard as media from Heinz earlier talking about the fact that yeah. they didn't want to jump on a bandwagon and come up. We've seen so many brands sort of run into trouble with, you know, uh, black washing announcements or Jerry Dakin starting yesterday talking about how brands can get it wrong when they try and engage with, with the BAME community or the, you know, the gay community. So, so how, how, how can people, you know, how people go forward? Um, I just want to jump in there and actually um, what I've seen, um, not necessarily uh, calling out specific brands, but the themes of uh, inaction or action quickly have resonated with me more than the actual brands themselves so those that are have been able to immediately come out um, and make an authoritative statement um, have meant more to me um, than the brands that have waited in the wings and, and and really you know wondered what to do and everything else which might be the right thing but just for me personally i felt that, that those who have come out um, and done an action things have, have been the, the winners for me Vic, this is quite a good part of the question. Vic asks, I suppose, directly related to that, she asks, or he asks, again, sounds great what you're saying is at quickly, but there's no way I could have convinced my company to do something so soon. I guess the point is, you know, not every brand can act as fleet of people at small startups. Start. No, and many have, have gone on, uh, on, on their social platforms and actually had the dialogue on their podcast and actually said, look, we didn't know what to do. We only saw something happen on Instagram um, and we didn't feel that we had a voice. Um, it, it, is, it is challenging um, and I think it's deeply personal as well uh, to everyone, the recipient of what you're looking at and what you're absorbing. Yeah, and I would say um, some of the work that we've done at user testing, we actually asked consumers, um, you know, uh, you know, around their expectations and 95% of the people in our study expected uh, or, and expect your organization to say something. So silence is just, it's not an option, unfortunately. Well, I think we're out of time. Uh, I'm Janelle and Justin, great joint names for presenting. Janelle and Justin, <laughs> <laughs> great, great talks and really great answers. You generated lots of interest. So thanks so much for your time. Hope to see you again very soon. We're now moving on to our next amazing speaker. It's Nick Fry, who's head of UX at Shale. Uh, his presentation in front of brands will only succeed in D2C if they get the experience right. D2C, one of the hottest areas at the moment. So let's hear what Nick has to say. Nick, again, you've got 99 seconds. 
and they haven't told anyone off radio, so I'm dying to haul you off. Go. Thank you. So the purpose of this talk is to illustrate the transition of focus between three experience environments, three key experience environments, and they are the brand experience, the purchase experience, and the support experience. We talk a lot about brands, but what is a brand? Brand is what you evoke emotionally. It's what you create experientially, and it's what you recreate by the association of success experiences. Now that is brand value. And brand value is the aggregation of all of the user's interactions. And you create an end-to-end -end experience. We call this the experience trinity, the power of three. It's the power of the brand experience, the seduction of the purchase experience, and the promise of a service and support experience. And with that, these are the emotions you create. So brand excites, the seduction inspires, and the service creates trust. Trust is everything. You can only win if you have a customer's trust. And you can only win regardless of your brand or product value or reputation if you have service. And we want to create an experience cycle, a cyclical process. So what can we control with online direct-to-consumer experiences? Well, we can't control the brand perception because it's outside the online. We can't control the product quality. What we can control is the user's contextual needs. So it's keeping mindful of user's intent, contextual to retain their purchase intent, and sequentially, predictably, resolving their needs. Carefully directing expectations, the previous action, the current action, and the next action. That creates confidence and it creates trust. An experience cycle. Promise, post-purchase support, and data, use data driving to drive it, add personalization, post-sales communication, integrate the online history with the contact history, and you can evolve an experience life cycle. That turns into a customer life cycle. And you synthesize a product habit life cycle. That's what you need. For brands to succeed, trust in support, put service support up front with purchase. Thank you. Uh, oh, I was just about to press. You're itching to. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, that was amazing. Amazing. Right, we've got lots of Thank questions coming in, so let's go through them. First of all, we've got one here from Andrew who says, How has COVID affected the DTC market overall? It's a nice, big, broad question. Well, I think um, looking at, uh, at what I'm trying to say here, in, in a way, it's a terrible thing, but it's made brands wake up to what they have to do. When you can't support face to face, you have to support online. And for me, it's a, it's a great wake up call. It's an opportunity for brands to just say, okay, let's get our ducks in order because we need to support customers. It's not that there's, there's different online environments, right? We're evolving. We're a sophisticated market. We've got the aggregators like Amazon and many others. And you have an expectation when you deal with them that you, you almost take your potluck. I love Amazon, but you take your potluck because they're a market space. With a brand, you have to support. It's about that, those three pillars. You, can, you, you have brand value that aggregates from an experience built up over years, usually. But if you can't support and you're taking the money, you're nothing. You have, to, you have to be there. It's not that you run away into the, into, the, into the ether of the online. You've got to stand there. And when they turn around, you've got to be there and look after them in every possible way, whether that's predictive, whether that's CRM or predictive next action. So if you open up an app, it should say, hey, great, you've got these products. Do you not know how to use it? Do you want to register your warranty? you got a problem. We probably know what the problem is because we built the product. That's how you should be. That's a hundred percent support service. So, okay. sorry, to answer your question, COVID. Yeah, it should, it should have made people wake up. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. One here from Carol. She asked, uh, what are the best examples you've seen of data informing experience design? That is a very, very good question. There's a couple of good players that I, I always like to reference. I mean, it's too easy to reference Apple, but Apple are great because when you look, when you, when you look any genius bar stuff, they've got all your products and they've gone through the sequential stuff. Dyson are very much the same. They know their product, when their products were built, when it left the factory, they know what you expect, what issue you might have. It's generally not a fault because they're good products, but they know what the experience demand might be. Um, I love AO because it delivers everything. It, you get phone call, you get your products delivered. I just, you know, I know I shouldn't name brands, but, but they get it right for me. There's countless others. But, but for me, to answer that question, is anyone who uses your data to be predictive, that, that's the answer to everything. So you shouldn't name brands. I sort of think you should Sorry. name brands. So let's name what brands are getting it wrong. You know, AO, Apple, and oh. stuff. I know you just fed unfair to pick on people, but you must have seen things that you just met you. I wouldn't want to name any brands because it's probably not fair, but um, everyone's got their issues. But I mean, I, I think I'll go back to the point of that if, if you use data, you can get it right. Um, I mean, data now is everywhere. We're, we're firing off data just by, by existing when we wake up. So surely as a brand, it's our responsibility to use that data responsibly and provide a really, really good service. You know, and I think moving forwards as we evolve from our online beings to our online lifestyle, 
fails. It's the brands that do embrace data in the right way and serve predictive solutions to a user. They're the ones that will scream ahead. And Apple have done it from the start. You know, I don't like always quoting them, but, um, but yeah, it, it, you know, that's, yeah, in short. A uh, question here from Diane who says, okay, you can't name brands, but can you give us some of the commonest mistakes you've seen? Uh, yeah, common mistakes are getting CRM wrong. Um, so a lot of brands, you'll buy a purchase, you'll buy, purchase a wonderful product and then you get an email or be part of a, a wider CRM group and say, hey, buy this product. And if you bought it for a different price point or you're being fired off an email when you just bought the product, to me that says this, these people don't care. So you really should get an email saying, hey, Nick, thanks for buying X product of this. Here's how to download the app and here's a video how to use it. And if you've got any problems, here's support. For me, that, that, that says that's trust, right? So, so that's what you need to do. This, I've, I've seen cases where it's gone, dear XXX, name here. You've bought a product field here. No one's bothered with the CRM database. You know, they've never bothered to, to actually get it, get it sorted out and fired off at the right time. So I think site, site, the cyclical process is critical. Perfect. Okay, I've got a question here from Charlie. He says, he or she says, uh, we've had our budgets cut. What can I do right now to improve experience when I can't throw my wallet at it? CRM. Easy. It's old school. 1990s. Get your emails right and you got it. Buy a product, get an email. Thanks for buying. How can we help? <laughs> <laughs> or text. If it's in app, just, just do a push notification. Thanks for doing it. Thank, thank people for doing something. And that's as good as, that's as, good as delivering something in a box. Mm -hmm. Hey, thanks. Thanks. We really appreciate your support. I love all that. Thanks for sending an email. Thanks for registering. Thanks for logging in. You know, thanks for setting up an account. That's, that's the answer. Really easy and cost effective. Excellent. We've got one here from Mo who says, when there are no live events or outdoor, or outdoor and limited bricks or mortar retail, what technologies are there in the digital sphere to bring brands to life? Again, I'll probably go back to the same answers. If you can, if you can bring people in with communication, talk to them. It's the, it's the age old one. Hey, how are you doing? You've, we noticed you bought a product three months ago. How clean's your house? How's, it, how you, how's, it, how's, it, how's the sound quality? You know, how's, your, how's your coffee maker? Here's some, here's some extra coffee tips. You know, all the, all the brands that are doing the, the lifestyle um, engaging pieces, the ones that are winning. It's just about that simple thing. Talk to your neighbor, ask them how they're doing. You, sold some, you, know, you sell someone something, ask them how they get on with it. Here's some things you might want. Excellent. Sorry, I seem to be using the same amounts of everything, but it's uh... oh, really, you know, commitment. Or, you know. <laughs> yeah. oh, at least you know what you're talking about. Next question from Amit, he says, again, sounds great, this personalization thing, but I don't really want every band to be my best friend. Is personalization really the answer for every company? Well, again, that comes to the second part, which is, which is servicing users' needs, right? Do they want to be communicated all the time? I think a courteous thanks for buying email is great. Do you want to opt out of this? You know, that's where you go into a sequential reveal. Let's not have a form where you've got to put your name, your inside leg measurement, who your favorite football team is, what cake you like, and then you know, expect to see a, 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 deluge, a, devel, a great deluge of emails. Let's ask them what they want, but the minimum should be thanks for purchasing. Here's how to use it. Here's your helps. And I think that, that's it. You know, you're right. I don't want to be bothered. I have, a, I have an email address I just use for registering things. And I can, I, if I'm happy with it, I'll migrate onto a different email address. So, yeah. you know, I think that you shouldn't have to do that as a user in, in 2020. We should be able to have those options. Up, you know, I should choose what I want. We do have it to, to a degree with GDPR, but not, not to the level. And that's the experience of signing up. That's the experience of, of managing those, those, com, those com, uh, communications with a with user. Excellent. One here from Philippa, and she definitely, she asks, what are the risks of automating customer experience and could it backfire? Uh, well, that's, yeah, I mean, how long have you got? So, so there, are, there are risks on, with... We've got, we've got 30... No, got 45 seconds. Okay, 45, easy, right, okay, easy, easy. Right, so if you automate it completely, yeah, you're in a complete pickle because you're not gonna update it. If you set some algorithms and you have a, a, a program of communications, it's not a problem. If you use data to predictively um, uh, estimate what someone's gonna want to do, that's fine. But like anything, agile, iterate, evolve, keep on it, don't just leave it. You know, you can't leave a machine to anything, it'll just keep on munching things. So yeah, keep on it, keep personal, keep human. Perfect, Nick. You're bang on time. Every part of the thing. It was fantastic. Thanks for your answers. Thanks for your talk. Thanks for spending time with us. Nick. Thank you so much. Thank you. So now we're going across to Adam Oldfield. He's MD at Force 24. Uh, and his talk is intriguingly titled Right Message, Right Person, Right Time. So you've got 99 seconds. And then you've got about half an hour to do some horning. So don't go over. Your time starts now.
Hi, yeah, I'm Adam, and I want to reinforce what we already know and what you've probably heard a hundred times. And, and actually, I want to just add some extra parts. Automation is the key to unlocking significant growth and, 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 and personalization. The point that I also want to reinforce that personalization isn't really a thing that we isn't really a thing anymore. It's just something we do. So it shouldn't be a new thing. It's just what we're doing. Automation is your excuse to pull the constituent parts together. Next slide, please. We've been getting away with it for now because large data sets have meant that the, change, the chance of hitting the right person at the right time, the right message was much higher. But mail servers are punishing us now, marketers that don't think strategically about data. And over time, results start to diminish. Also, the other thing was our competitors weren't doing this either. They weren't nailing it. But let's understand, sending the, right, sending the wrong message to the right person at the right time is a fail. And conversely, sending the right message to the right person at the wrong time is also a fail. So we need to hit this because it's going to be a diminishing trend of results if we're not nailing personalization. Next slide, please. One of the key factors is decisioning on insights. All of the data is dotted around the business. As the previous speaker spoke, talk and spoke about the fact that the data is in CRM. Yes, it's true, but it's also in the web activity, the browsing behavior of what people are doing right now. Lead scoring, CRM insight, customer data, all of these things lead us to get the right message at the right time. Next slide, please. We've got to free the marketeer from the grunt work. With automation, we can unlock the whole new world of strategic thinking. If we're not thinking about this, we're thinking about building campaigns. We're thinking more strategically and delivering the right message to the right person. I'm over. Wow, you did it. Well done. Congratulations. You actually, I didn't even know that time. That's me getting lazy. I don't even know. Close enough. <laughs> I'm, I'm horn lazy. Thank you so much. So excellent talk again on a very hot topic of personalization. So we've got lots of questions coming in. I've only got about two minutes to get to them. So we've got one here from Vinay who says, personalization is great, but we've seen lots of reports recently from people like Forrester on how CMOs are now pulling back from it. So is it really the silver bullet we we're all promised? Yeah, so it's interesting that, no, that's, that's, that's a misnomer. Personalization is a misnomer. What we're saying essentially is personalization isn't just putting first name or putting the, I'm saying it's the right message, right time, right person. So it's three constituent parts and no CMO anywhere is saying, I don't care about the right person or the right message or the right time. They're just saying that actually what we're pulling back on is it might be one of those elements, but we're still relying on the critical mass. And the problem is actually, it is, it is the focus and the mail servers, as I've already said, are punishing people that aren't taking this seriously. So forget what the, the CMOs are saying, the mail servers are telling us, if you want to get through, that's what you've got to do. Okay, question from Katie. Uh, what about regulation, things like GDPR and more to come? So, so again, it plays into the hands of GDPR and more to come. So the fact of the matter is personalization, like I say, isn't just sending me the right message at the right time, it's, it's everything. And so GDPR, it's a separate issue. That's about permissions. And yes, I've got to have permissions to talk to people, but I should use that permission wisely and not be talking to people. Say and spray is the, the diet, the antithesis of GDPR really. Mm. So I believe it actually plays more tightly into the hands, but the key really liberation of the marketeer to focus on this through automation means I'm not doing things the old fashioned way. I can't run three dimensional campaign structures when I'm doing it all myself through manual intervention, I need to use automation to be able to do it to free my mind up. Precious asks, is automation just a way for my boss to cut costs? I guess she's talking about, you know, she's probably got a team, you know, and there's often a worry that automation means people are gonna be out of jobs. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, so what, we, what we believe is it's not about that. It's about the liberation of your thinking. So at the moment, most marketeers report that they're actually not delivering their best effort because they're too busy. And actually where we can, oops, <laughs> where we can liberate the marketeer to be less busy, we start to do what we actually as marketeers wanted to do when we went to university, started our first job, whatever it is, all those years ago. And that's build compelling arguments that get people to do things, not managing campaigns you know it's it's liberating the marketeer so it's not about cost saving although that is a factor adam that was a great talk great question answering and also great background thank you so much for spending time with us thanks very much no problem nice to see you so the next speaker Pat dunbar he's the digital director at radisson blue and his title of his talk which i find quite intriguing is audience but as a strategy 
So over to you, you've got 99 seconds. I've got two more chances to hold people off, so don't go over. Now, over to you. Thank you, next slide, please. Today's session is about audience as a strategy. Can you go to the next slide, please? What, what do we mean by that? We are living in a new reality, Good. where in unprecedented times, where, can you please click three times, where the rules of the games change completely. It's that reality, it pushes everyone to rethink uh, completely, to go through not only digital and operational transformation, but more importantly, mindset transformation, to embed that in the company's culture. Because every single rule that we know about operation, best practices, logistic, completely fall short. Next slide, please. And what that means, that means we need to come up with any framework to address that. So what, I'm th what I propose is what you call privacy first. Can you just click one, tap, please? And in the middle is the audience, is the customers. And around that, what I call the first layer is the trust layer that's centered around the key foundation element to uh, serve the customers. And for a hospitality industry, as you can imagine, contactless is completely a complete diversion from delivering that the personal experience, that the real experience, and also redefinition of the brand and value proposition. Next slide, please. The second layer is what I call is the contextual layer. That's include the data, the signal devices, all the micro and behavioral patterns, but as well as the, mic the macro trends that help us understand, one more click, please, to help us interpret this to an experience that needs to be delivered. So we don't start with experience and see how the customer fits. We start from all these patterns and signals to define what the experience is. One more click, please. And that will help us to develop the content and the overall personalization. One more click, please. And what that means, that means we need to also think that how that fits with the, within the strategic objectives and how are we going to cascade that relationship with the customer and ensure that experience across every single touch points and layers within the customer journey fits perfectly. One more click, please. And we need to link all of, obviously, all of these, all of these patterns and behaviors and everything to uh, deliverables. And that means the op to ensure operational excellence, we need to ensure that that experience is delivered seamlessly across in property, in store, and via automation and everything to deliver that consistently. Thank you. Uh, you tad, wow, you did it just, just in time. Fantastic, thank you so much. Right, we're coming to the end of the day, and you did, I'm quite impressed you did all that for the amount of time. There's a lot of information to get across. Uh, lots of questions here. I've got one from Ashley, who asks, how has your organization managed the last few months being in the sector you're in? I suppose it's really interesting to hear from someone, you know, from the, from the, the travel industry, how have you dealt with it over the last few months? Uh, it's been uh, quite significant, something that we have never experienced before, to be honest. And that's why uh, one of the key elements was to uh, go through a complete restructuring, some changes, transformational elements, and see how can we reduce the cost significantly, but at the same time, make sure that we also comply with the regulation. We had hundreds of hotels across uh, Europe, Middle East and Africa and Americas as well had to close due to multiple reasons. So for us was to ensure that what we call the new layer, the trust and transparency layer, how do we introduce new uh, safety protocols to ensure the, the peace of mind and the, and the customers and also our own staff are uh, protected in the best possible way. And on that, obviously, we, need, we needed, we had to look into, uh, you know, all of the, uh, all of the cost cutting and, 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 and some of the schemes that was introduced by the, by the government and different industry, uh, different countries to ensure that we are able to navigate through. Uh, and I would say we are pretty, uh, in that sense, we were able also to manage an additional, you know, uh, uh, resources from our own owners that helps us actually to to be very well prepared and currently we do not have any issue as now the market starts on the recovery excellent good answer one here from Hanoon who asks how do you understand and measure how people are engaging with your brand outside of your own channels uh, that's a very good question um, I mean, we are we embarked on a five-year transformation plan that to change our IT uh, and all the operating systems, including the one on the property, CRM, everything, move to one integrated ecosystem. And that's a five-year uh, transformation initiatives that, you know, we have hundreds of millions of dollars uh, investments behind that to build that integrated ecosystem. And based on that, we are going to be able to integrate, you know, the call center, the digital, the, the offline channels. That's currently, actually, it's in motion for us to be able to get to that level. Absolutely fantastic, and we are bang on time. Thank you so much for your talk and answer questions. Last talk of the day, 
On day three is Cameron Worth. He's the co-founder of Sharpen. Cameron, you're the finale of the day, so you have to have the best talk of the whole day, or the whole three days. Right. Over to you in a second, we've got 99 seconds, then we'll have questions and we'll do a wrap. So right. without further ado, Cameron, your time starts now. Great. Uh, hopefully everyone can see my screen. Uh, I'm going to share with you a couple of case studies from the, from the last 12 months as we look at the um, opportunity to bring connected technologies closer to consumers at different stages of the shopper journey. Now, this has, um, I think, become a lot more relevant over the last uh, couple of months, given the, the new touch points and the new battlegrounds that are emerging, for example, in the connected home, but also the... Um, also the, the implications for what does it mean for a retail experience of the future. When we talk about in-store experience and we think about designing retail interactions around a human interface, we actually now need to start thinking about a potential fallback in terms of digital first engagement solutions. So I wanted to run you through a couple of those very, very quickly. Um, the first one that we're looking at across our cosmetics clients is virtual try -on. So being able to negate the need for testers in store to be able to map uh, products to your face and be able to experiment with the different shades. Uh, we've been experimenting a lot with facial recognition, uh, using that for things like event registration, uh, things like um, pop-up events, making sure that you can adhere to social distancing. This is a system that we built for, uh, for an event called Digital Podge last year. We've also been exploring a lot around digital signage at point of sale and taking the need away from the sales assistant. So the idea that the product becomes the remote control for the store experience, uh, connected packaging as a way for, uh, for the brand to be able to talk in store and post purchase using appless technologies like NFC and QR codes. Uh, this is an example of, uh, of a project that we launched with over a million NFC enabled connected bottles. And we saw a 30% increase in session lengths during lockdown. So there's actually concrete evidence. And the last one that we've launched is a future of contactless retail space in Shoreditch um, in partnership with The Drum, where we're helping brands explore. There you go. Oh. Amazing. I just got the volume off, but then you just got to finish your talk. So we're all winning. Thank you so much. That was a great presentation for the day. Uh, I love Digital Pods. Digital Pods, one of the most exciting events in the calendar. And obviously a slide there on Math Fest. As well, equally exciting event. So great talk. We've got some great questions from the end of the day. There's one here from Royal who comes in and says, how do you think the physical space of retail is going to be transformed by the technologies you're talking about post COVID? So I think, I mean, a lot of the, I guess there's a, there, there's a very tense conversation to have with a lot of the brands that we're working with where they've, like I've said, they've designed their entire retail experience around a human interface. And when you suddenly overlay that with consumers feeling threatened to approach human beings and when they don't want to touch things in store, it totally re-engineers re the way that you need to think about retail experience. So actually, I think the the sensible answer is to say no one really knows yet, but I think brands need to start trialing with all of these new touch points and actually use this as a, as a way to force themselves to start in, engaging with these new technologies. So. Question here from Freddie who says, we've seen this sort of technology talked about for a long time now and it's taking off, but what are the biggest barriers you find put up by retail companies? Yes, well, means. I think, yeah, the, the, the retailers for us have always been a pain to, to work with. Uh, it's actually the brands who own their own environments that we've had much better experience working with because they're driving innovation through their own environments. And actually for us, for example, working with a, a Tesco or a Sainsbury's has always been a nightmare. But when you come with a brand with an innovation that they can just support and they can endorse in their environments, they can learn from and they can potentially talk it and sell to other brands, that tends to be the, the, the recipe for success. Um, because ultimately the retailer needs to have a robust commercial model to be able to advocate the technology. So if you can incubate that with one of their brands who already takes space within their environment, then you're onto a winner. So. Jane asks, is this all about branding or commerce? Um, I think it, 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 building brands in a, in a connected world is done through technology enabled service and experience design. Commerce is an outcome, but commerce used to be the end point of a relationship. And if you look at things like connected packaging, it actually creates the start of a new relationship post purchase. So before when I used to buy a product, that was the end of the relationship with the brand. I might have got a dodgy email two weeks later with a recipe. But actually now, if you can start engaging with people through the products, you've got a new opportunity to build brands post-purchase and drive a, a new form of loyalty, in, in my opinion. So. Perfect. Last question, last question of the day. And it's from Caitlin. She asks, will these technologies put off uh, consumers that aren't so tech savvy themselves, therefore narrowing 
the retail demographic? Uh, I think it depends on the brand, depends on what they stand for, depends on the technographics of the consumer. I mean, we never start from a position of looking at technologies as a hammer and a nail scenario. Um, what we try and do is we think about what are the pain points along the shopper journey? What type of shoppers are we speaking to? And then how do you design solutions around those that are appropriate? And that really helps guide the, the choices of the technology. I mean, we, we see it sharp in that the kind of connected brand building is a, is a creative challenge and not really a technical one. And, and I'd always watch out for people who are coming to you saying, we've got this technology solution and we're going to put it across every stage of the customer journey because normally they're talking nonsense or, or they don't really understand what it is to solve brand challenges. So. Perfect. Cameron, that was amazing. Welcome against time. That was great talk and great question answering and also great plants on your bookshelf. So you might do quite on the bookshelf competition. So Thank thanks so much for your time. It's great talk. Thank you so much. I've uh, got a couple of housekeeping things before we end the day. Uh, Andy, poll master and competition master, what's the latest on our competitions? Well, the pointless pandemic purchases, and I think that's going to be the last time I ever say that, um, has gone mad in the last five minutes. And we've seen some absolute classics. Uh, Gemma, who I think will shortly be seeking a new husband, um, is slightly concerned about um, her husband's purchase of a large pressure washer, which has seemed to be unopened. Gemma also would like to take into, they take, ask the jury to take into consideration a pizza stone, the picture of which is on the, uh, in the pub, on the app, and that looks huge. Um, we've also just had some fantastic things just sent into us. Um, and, and I would ask you to go and have a look at this on the, in the pub, because I, I, I'm going to find it hard to describe. This one's an owl. Um, yeah, it, it's an owl. I mean, someone's had it sent, bought an, a lockdown owl which is fantastic. And underneath the words divorce keep cropping up. I'd like to point out that's not from anyone I'm married to. Um, so the owl, for those who are worrying, is Julius. He's a large plastic owl that I bought to scare away those pesky pigeons on my balcony. That's Curtis Spencer, client manager at Lido. Well, well done, Curtis. <laughs> um, it's right up there with Sarah Mann's bizarre pedal phone, which I still don't quite understand. Um, where are we? On the polls. Do you know it was a quiet day on the poll front? It was a quiet day. Probably. But I think we had too much good content. Too yeah. much good content. Yeah, another amazing day of content. We've got another incredible day starting tomorrow at three o'clock. Uh, see that at three o'clock. We've got brands, 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 brands. So many people talking. It's going to be amazing. Uh, I think we know who's won the Andy's Marmite competition. I think it's Julia Smith. So, Julia, we've got to confirm back, backstage, but I think you'll get a bottle of Marmite, jar of Marmite coming your way. Uh, can I also point out that Julia Smith did send in a picture of her bookshelf? So desperate to dominate the conversation, the conversation was she. Um, she might win bits of conscious and Jean Marmite. It'd be an amazing week now. So, anyway, I think we're wrapping up now. Thank you so much, to everyone, for joining us. It was a really great day again, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye bye.